Today in this video, we're doing Calc BC problem set number 29. The problems and a playlist are in the description below. Let's take a look. Number one, it's calculator R1 is theta sine theta to the one third. That's weird. R2 is eight cosine squared of theta. Uh, for part A, what we want to do is find the area in quadrant one and two bounded by R1 of theta and the x axis. I'm going to switch right over to the calculator, do the problem, come back, write it up. Okay, let's start off by putting in a graph page. So doc four, and I'm gonna choose option four for graph. I'm gonna graph it in polar, uh, see what this thing looks like. So that's menu, option four, nope, menu option three, and then option five. Uh, I'm just gonna type theta. Theta's in the pi key. If you're on the handheld, it's easy enough to do. Uh, for me, it's easier to actually type theta. So theta times sine of theta raised to the one third. And then what I'm gonna do, because we're looking at quadrants one and two, I'm gonna change uh, the theta values to just be zero to pi, which actually, uh, so typically they'll give you the graph. Uh, this is actually kind of not a safe thing to do because it's entirely possible that in quadrant two, um, you will hit more of this function, right? Because angles that are from quadrant four with negative R values could put you in quadrant two. Angles that um, put you in quadrant three, but with negative R values would put you in quadrant one. But this is the intention in this problem is that you would get this region. So what I'm gonna do is just set it up and integrate it. So we're going um, a normal thing here. So I'm gonna do doc for, put in a calculator page and we're gonna have one half uh, integral. So shift plus, you can also use the template. I just think on the handheld shift plus is really the way to go. Uh, pi is just here. And then I'm gonna hit tab. Now what I wanna do is take um, the polar curve, which I have stored as R1. You can use any variable you want here. I usually use T on the calculator page for theta. It's just easier to access. Uh, and then I have to square that. So it's one half R squared and then D theta. Uh, and then I'll put in a T. I'm gonna press control enter and we get our answer. Let's see what this warning is. Uh, approximate arithmetic. There's nothing you can do about that. That warning comes up. Sometimes it comes up on uh, the AP exam. Nothing you can do about it. You just accept the answer and move on. So uh, I'm gonna go back to the handwritten stuff and I will see you there. Okay, and from our calculator work, we're gonna write down the definite integral because you have to write that. You can't just write a numerical value. So we're gonna do one half, then the integral from zero to pi of R1, and we wanna square that, and then d theta. And then our calculator told us that that was approximately 4.773. All right, let's take a look at uh, the next part. So we wanna find the area of the larger region in quadrant two and three bounded by both R1 and R2. Again, I'm gonna switch right over to the calculator and I'll come back and write up the work that I would show on paper. Uh, picking up on the calculator where we were at the end of the previous part, uh, R1 is already defined. I'm gonna go into my graph page again um, and I'm gonna define R2. So let's click and uh, so press tab. R2 is gonna be eight and then cosine of theta and squared. So on the inspire, you can't do cosine squared of theta. You have to do cosine of theta and then square that. Make sure you're aware of that. I'm gonna press enter. Um, and so what I need to do is for R1, if you remember, I limited that to uh, zero to pi. I'm gonna change this zero to two pi and we see this. Um, so what I really wanna do is I wanna find the larger region that is bounded in quadrants two and three um, by both R1 and R2. Okay, so uh, I'm looking at this thing and uh, I mean, I don't know, is there, isn't there, oh, the larger region, like this, this region, this is the bigger region. I don't know what I was doing. I was like, there's all these little regions. Uh, this is clearly the region, right? So I need to find this intersection point and I need to find this intersection point. The real question is, are they at those intersection points at the same theta value? I hope so. Uh, I'm gonna press menu five and just kind of trace to see if I can like estimate it. Uh, like around here is definitely, uh, one of the curves gets to basically the intersection point. I'm gonna press up. Yeah, so they're both there at the same time. Uh, let's keep going. So here, I'm just pressing the right arrow. Uh, I'm gonna press. Yeah, so okay, they get to the two intersection points at the same time. This is a much harder problem if they don't do that. On the AP exam, I would never expect that to happen. Um, all right, so what I'll do is I'm going to change to function mode, graph these in function mode, find those intersections, right? They're somewhere between pi over two and three pi over two. So let's do that. Uh, doc four, 
I'm going to add another graph page and I'm going to graph uh, just R1, but I'm going to use X as my variable and I'm going to graph R2, uh, R2, and I'm going to use X as my variable. Okay, so what I want to do is change it so that my window, this is just for convenience, but I'm going to change my window so that it goes from uh, pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2 because that's where those intersection points are that matter for us. And you can see them. Uh, let's find these intersections. So menu 814, and we're just going to click, click. We get both of them at the same time. So remember, this is theta is on the horizontal or the x-axis, and then r is on the vertical. So I'm going to store this, and I'm going to store this. So arrow over it, press control menu, um, store. I'm going to store this as uh, a, I guess, because it's the first one. And then arrow over this, control menu. I'm going to store this as b. So I still need to find the area. We're just gonna do big area minus little area. They have the same bound, so I can put them in the same integral. You cannot use bounded area here. Polar areas are not the same as rectangular areas. Let's go to um, a calculator page. And what I'm gonna do is polar area always has a one half. I'm gonna do shift plus. We're gonna go from the value of A to the value of B, which I didn't read out before. Maybe, uh, give me a second, let me finish this and I'll just show you what those values are so you can jot them down. Uh, all right, so I wanna do the bigger area minus the smaller area. I didn't pay attention to which was which. Uh, let me go back, I guess, to, well here you can see R2 is farther away, right? Uh, if we go to the polar graph, uh, R2 is the red one, R1 is the blue one, so like clearly, R2 is, is farther away, that's gonna give you the bigger area. I'm gonna go back to this. So I wanna do, if you get this wrong, if they're in the wrong order, uh, what'll happen is you just get the negative of the correct answer, so it's not really the biggest deal. I mean, when you get a negative answer, you should be skeptical, but you probably just switched the outer and the inner curves. DT, uh, control, well, it doesn't matter because A and B are definitely decimals. So I'm fr I press enter. This thing, I think, is thinking about this. There you go. It, that is not an easy integral for it to do, apparently. Uh, and let me just recall the values of A and B so we can jot those down. All right, so uh, that's how I would deal with this problem. I'm going to go back, handwrite some stuff. I will see you there. Okay, so uh, we had to figure out where the curves intersected between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. The calculator told us these values. So this is what I would write on paper. It's what I'm writing here. We got uh, 2.09544. I called that A, we got 3.93512, I called that B. Um, then we have to write down our definite integral. So in this case, it's one half, the integral from A to B, the further out curve, which is R2 squared, minus the closer curve, which is R1 squared, um, and then D theta. And then our calculator just gave us the answer, 27.636. All right, let's take a look at the next one. For 0 to 2 pi, not including 0 or 2 pi, we want to find the horizontal and vertical tangents to R1. Uh, okay, so first of all, uh, horizontal and vertical tangents, we're going to need dy dx. We're going to need to think about some stuff. I'm going to start off actually writing this. So we're going to rewrite them parametrically. So x is r times cosine. So it's going to be r1 and then cosine of theta. y is going to be r1 and then sine of theta. So that's to begin with. Uh, then what we also need is dy dx. So dy dx we know parametrically is dy d theta divided by dx d theta. So we have this. Now to find horizontal, we want dy dx equals zero. To find uh, vertical, we want dx d theta to equal zero. I'm now going to switch to the calculator, do the work there, and then I'll come back and write everything up. Okay, so carrying on from what we already have on the calculator here, uh, I'm going to add a new page, I guess. Uh, I'm going to add a new graph page because I'm looking for the horizontal and vertical tangents to R1. So I'm just going to graph R1 again uh, in its own page just so we can look at it. Uh, let's see. Also, I don't know if I'm losing my voice. It's really hard to say, but uh, things don't sound great right now, but I don't feel bad. So we'll see. All right. So I'm adding polar. Uh, I'm going to just go back and find R1 uh, and I will graph it. So we have this. Uh, I look at this and I can see like I'm going to just trace a little bit. Uh, I think that there's like a vertical tangent line somewhere around here, like 0.74-ish or something, or eight, I don't know. There's no way to tell. Somewhere in there. I think there's a horizontal tangent line somewhere around here. Um, if I keep going, 
There's definitely a vertical tangent line somewhere here. And then here there's definitely a horizontal tangent line. So there's some, there's two of each. So I know what I'm looking for and that's good. Now what I'm gonna do is add a calculator page and kind of like go to work by uh, storing some things. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna store x1 of t. I don't like storing anything as just x of t, which is why I'm calling it x1. Uh, and if I had to do like a lot of stuff, it's like x1 is the x coordinate for just r1 and, and you go from there. Um, so colon equals, it's gonna be r1 of t times cosine of t, right? And then uh, we do the same thing for y. Uh, so I'm gonna say y1 of t colon equals r1 of t and then times sine of t. I know that on the handheld you're pressing slightly different buttons, but hopefully you're on top of those buttons by now. Um, press enter, it says done. So we have x is r cosine, y is r sine. We also know that dy dx is gonna be the derivative, so it's dy d theta divided by dx d theta. So I'm gonna set that up also. I'm gonna call it uh, dy dx, I guess, of t. And it's a fraction. And I'm gonna do shift minus with respect to t of y1 of t. You can use a var key. It's actually a really good idea to do that. And then shift minus t uh, x1 of t. Okay, so we have like everything set up that I think we're gonna need. Uh, actually, I do need, I just need dx of t to be a thing um, so that I can solve the problem. So dx of t is gonna be uh, our derivative with respect to t of x1 t. Okay, so horizontal tangent lines, uh, dy dx is gonna be equal to zero. Simultaneously, dx dt cannot be zero but that's not actually an issue here. So I'm just gonna do dy dx equals zero. I don't think there's any chance that solve is gonna get those values for us. So what I'm gonna do is use a graph. So I'm gonna graph. Now I'm in function mode. I'm gonna graph dy dx as a function of x. I'm gonna change the window zero to two pi. First, let's do this. So let's do menu four, zero to pi, uh, two pi, like that. Um, so we want dy dx equals zero. We don't include zero, we don't include two pi. Uh, it looks like there are places where dy dx is undefined. That's good, right? Because that would be horizontal, tan uh, vertical tangent lines rather. So we can't really use this to find them, but it does look like there are two of those. Um, I'm gonna graph zero and I'm gonna graph menu eight, one, I'm uh, not graph. I'm gonna find the intersections, menu eight, one, four. There and there. Okay, so I have the two theta values at which um, dy dx is equal to zero. I'm gonna store those. So I'm gonna store those as, I don't know. I, I got like a lot of variables going now. I'm gonna call this C, I guess. Uh, and I'm gonna call this a D. So the reason I'm doing that is I already use A and B in like part A or B of this problem. I don't remember which. Um, so C and D are going to be our theta values. So 2.070 and 4.899. Um, now what I'm gonna do is go back to this calculator page, and I'm gonna find the y value that's associated with those theta values. So I'm gonna do y1 of c, and I'm gonna do y1 of d. Those are our horizontal tangent lines. If we go back to the graph, uh, which I think is here, and I'm gonna, I think I'm still in trace, I'm just gonna type c. And you can see at c, that definitely looks like we are at a horizontal tangent line. The issue here is like, we can't tell what the y value should be there. 1.7 does look kind of accurate. If we type D, yeah, we're at like a minimum. So I, I think those are definitely correct. Um, the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna look for where dx d theta is equal to zero. We're gonna do basically the same process. So I'm gonna insert a graph page. I'm gonna graph in function mode. Uh, yeah, you can see we're like building up a lot of things here. dx as a function of x. We're only interested in zero to two pi. So let's change our window to zero to two pi. Let's graph zero again, which like you can go up and grab it or you could just graph it in another function. Uh, do menu eight, one, four, click. Uh-oh, where'd they go? They were there for like a second. It got confused, hold on. Menu eight, one, four. This might take a handheld a long time if it's taking this any time. Okay, I don't know, for that, that one it went really fast. All right, so zero is out because we're going zero to two pi not inclusive or exclusive. Uh, I'm gonna store this, what am I up to? D, 
Uh, I'm going to store this as E, and I'm going to store this as F. So these are the theta values. So uh, 0.923 and 3.433. Now we have to go to a calculator page again. Uh, should I just do it on a new one? Probably. Things are getting messy. Uh, all right. X, it's called X1. So X1 of T, X1 of E is 0 0.461. And then X1 of F is negative uh, 3.2, what is F? Three is, okay, is negative 3.282. Currently I have a mistake in my handwritten solutions. Um, I might go back and fix that. Uh, all right, so I think that the values that we get, let me just, I'll refresh your memory of what E and F are, E and F. Okay, so those are values for E and F. Those are the theta values at which dx dt is zero. And then uh, that means you're dividing by zero, so you're getting vertical uh, tangent lines. And then the x coordinates are 0.461 and negative 3.282. Okay, so I'm probably gonna fix that. Uh, let's go back to the handwritten stuff. See you there. Okay, so the part where uh, dy dx was equal to zero, we got theta was 2.0703 and 4.89945. I took those values on the calculator, I plugged them in uh, to y, right? And y was 1.738. Or uh, for the second value, we got negative 4.775. Then what we did was dx d theta equals zero. dx d theta equals zero gave us these theta values. 0.9232, whatever, and 3.4334. Then what we did was uh, we plugged those in and we got uh, that X is 0 0.461. And then also, I don't know, I'm writing this at a different time. Very hard to believe, but we got X is 3.4334, the same exact value as theta. Seems extremely unlikely, uh, but who knows? Uh, maybe I'll edit that somehow. Look at the screen to see if there's an edit. If there's not, good job me. All right, let's take a look at uh, the next part. Given that dy dx is 2x plus y minus 1 and y of 0 is equal to c. So the real value at 0 is c. We just don't know what c is. Um, you have to keep that in mind. If using Euler's method with two steps of equal size gives an approximation of y equals 4 at x equals 1 half, what is the value of c? So we have to figure out c we know the approximation is four. So what I'm doing when I'm highlighting that is I'm saying like your first row of your table has to use zero C. It has to not use one half four. Maybe I'm overemphasizing that because it took me forever to figure out why I was getting it wrong by using one half four as the first row. That's the approximation. An approximation going backwards won't give you the true original value. It'll just give you some other weird approximation. So I learned a little by doing this. Um, zero C the original value, we make our table, it's always gonna be x, y, and then dy, which is always gonna be dy dx, and then times delta x. So zero, and um, since we're going to one half, and we're doing two steps of equal size, each of them must be one fourth. So one fourth, two fourths is one half. We know the true value is c. So it's gonna look a little weird. Uh, we have to do the step size, which is one fourth, and then we take zero C and plug it into dy dx. So two times zero is zero. So we just get C minus one here. And then this, if we distribute, is one fourth C minus one fourth. We add C and one fourth C minus one fourth to get our new approximation of Y or our new Y value. So we have five fourth C minus one fourth. We do it again. Uh, so our step size is one fourth. And then when we plug in one fourth for X, we get one half. When we plug in, uh, just straight plug in for y, we get 5 4 c minus 1 4 and then minus 1 is part of the derivative. When we simplify this, it just cleans up to 5 over 16 c minus 3 over 16. So we take our old value of y and we add this approximation. Um, and when we do that, we know we're going to get 4. So this is where like the c value comes in. This value is gonna be what happens when we add uh, these two values, right? So if we add those two values together, we should get something equal to four. So I'm gonna add those two things together. When you add them together, you get 25 um, C over 16 minus seven over 16, and that has to equal four, which is 64 over 16. We're gonna add seven over 16 to get 25 C over 16. 
is equal to 71 over 16. We're going to, well, I don't know, however you want to do it, multiply by 16 twenty fifths. Um, we get that C is 71 over 25, and that's the whole problem. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, try not to make the mistake that I made. Try never to make mistakes, <laughs> but don't make the mistake I made, which uh, it was driving me insane. I kept trying to do the problem using uh, using one half four and then using negative one fourth as my delta x to like try to work my way back and solve for C versus starting at zero C and work my way forward. You have to start at zero C because that's the true value and then you get to an approximation. So just make sure you do that. That's the whole problem set. I hope this was helpful and good luck.